I was wondering if uh you have like a pre-show routine. Like if you did like because I like sometimes I'll dance around. Like I stretch a little bit before I go on. I I don't it's not something I like planned on doing, but I just noticed it's something that I tend to do a lot. All right. I don't know if you I don't know if you had anything like that you do. Because you said warm it up. You were around me for years. You know <laughs> what I do. All right. What's with the fucking questions? What's happening, you savages? It's Tuesday, the 12th of December. The check-in is brought to you by my favorite, the freeze pipe. You need a little something to get you through the holiday family reunions? We all do. Freeze pipe wants you to smoke and save big with their holiday sales that are running now until Christmas. This is where you get grandma present, the neighborhood cop, the delivery guy, get them all little bongs. Perfect for anybody who's tired of harsh smoke and coughing all the time. Freeze pipe makes freezable pipes, bubblers, bongs, more than cooled down smoke by over 300 degrees. Me, I love freeze pipe, guys. Right now I'm smoking like one of the, the many bongs that they sent me, and I love it. All you got to do is put the glycerin chamber in the freezer for an hour, and when you're ready to get down, pull it out, put it in, take a hit of that bong, and boom, nothing but icy clouds. The hell with Snoop Dogg. You could even keep the glycerin chamber in the freezer the whole time. You'll never have to wait. So do yourself a favor. Right now you're scratching your head. What do I get this guy? What do I? Freeze pipe. That's what you're going to get him. So go to thefreezepipe.com, pressing code Diaz, D-I-A-Z, for 10% off. Your entire order. Who's better than Freeze Pipe? Nobody. That's right. Shop holiday sales running until Christmas or use code Diaz for 10% off at thefreezepipe.com. Order today and smoke like royalty. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what the hell that means. The, the line is smoke like a doctor, you fuck. Anyway, the joint is also brought to you by Manscaped. Listen, men, ladies, you got to shave that fucking monkwa. If you want Santa to come, he can't come over and you got a bush that looks like a fucking jungle. This isn't about looking hot for a partner. This is about giving yourself the Christmas gift of silky smooth balls with Manscaped, the new Performance 5.0 package. This motherfucker's a savage. The Lawnmower 5.0 has got the ultra, the ultra body trimmer. Forget about your ball sack. You can shave your eyebrows, your nose hairs, the hairs in your asshole with a fishing wire. It's tremendous. It also has the weed whacker, the nose hair trimmer, and the crop soother aftershave lotion, and the best one of them all, the crop preserver ball deodorant. It takes the wrinkles out of your nutsack. It looks like a baby's elbow. Anyway, you're going to love fucking Manscaped. When you get the performance package 5.0, Manscaped will even throw in two gifts, a super comfortable pair of boxes and a bag to store your goodies in with a zipper inside. I ain't saying nothing. Whether you're buying it for yourself or for someone you love for Christmas, I got a discount code for you. You ready? Get 20% off free shipping with code Joey at manscaped.com. Who does that for you? Nobody, cocksucker. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code Joey. Manscaped wants you to have a happy holidays. And here we go. For you motherfuckers who want to be international, the year is almost over. I know you want to make, uh, you know, resolutions. You want to learn a new language in three weeks. You got to use my people. Babel. That. They know all the languages. Those are other language learning apps. Forget about it. They're just basically games that teach you nothing. Babel will get you talking to the Mexican waiter. You're talking to the guy that throws knives at Benihana. Forget about it. <laughs> Babel will get you learning with 10-minute lessons. You'll be taught everything. You need to have to work to be a world, you know, you can converse with anybody. Let's say you go to a strip club. You want to learn Russian. Bam! There you go. Listen, I love Babel. It reminds me of my old school Spanish. It's easy, it's fun, and you'll look smart. And what else could you want? Studies even show that using Babel for 15 hours is just like taking an entire semester of a college language course. So aren't you sick and tired of, of the Mexican way of not talking to you no more? You want to call them over. Senor, that's it. Where are you going to learn that? Babble. And here's a special limited time deal from the check-in listeners to get you started for the holidays. 
I'm going to give you 55% off, but only for check-in listeners for babble.com slash Joey. That's J-O-E-Y. That's 55% off at babble.com slash Joey. Spell Babel, B-A-B-B-E-L. They're even going to teach you how to spell Babel in German or Romanian or something like that. So babble.com slash Joey. Rules and restrictions may apply. Merry Christmas. Without further ado, it's the check-in. Turn off your TVs, run for your lives. It's over. They didn't put you on this planet just to give up. If Uncle Joey could do it, I could fucking lose. The world. That's what you gotta be thinking. Welcome back to show. It's Monday, cocksuckers. Tuesday, the twelfth and shit. What's up? My it's good buddy. to see you, dude. How good are you? See, you know, tip top, Magoo. Happy Hanukkah and all this shit. I hope you light another joint tonight. I, I put the menorah up. I got, I got joints in that motherfucker this year. Like I told you, that's that's the play right there. Anybody can light a fucking candle. Get a menorah, have- put Roman candles in that motherfucker, and get oh. the whole neighborhood jumping up and down. You know what I'm saying? Do you have a menorah? That'd be I, I need to get you one. I have a little baby menorah to put joints in there. <laughs> I don't want to offend nobody. Up- I don't want to offend nobody this time of the year. You know what I'm saying? It's a it's a rough time of the year. You want to be happy. So I, no one's gonna get offended by a menorah. Fuck them. That's great. I gotta dig it up. I don't know what the fuck I did with it. I had that. I got the Jewish hand. I got a bunch of stuff, you know. <laughs> the Jewish hand. <laughs> How was the concert, buddy? The concert was out of this world. First of all, like by Friday morning, if you know anything about me, I was not looking forward to it. I was hoping that <laughs> fucking somebody bombed New York or something like that. Like I was like, something's got to go down because I'm not in the fucking mood to go over there with 20 kids and shit. Sorry about the lights in the back. My wife ain't here tonight. Yeah. What do you want me to do? I I barely fucking uh, whatever. You but look, You look beautiful. But here's the, the thing that was very unique. Like, I went online, I looked at some of the bands, and I didn't know any of them, you know, except for Jelly Roll. For me, it wasn't even about the concert. It was to just take the kids. They wanted to go, and they had been excited, and the whole fucking thing. And the girls were excited, my wife and my neighbor, Crazy Chris. And, you know, we took two other moms, and we just shot over there on a bus, man, and I was telling somebody today, I got to the garden and I sat down with my daughter and the rest of the kids. And then the girls left to get T-shirts and stuff. But Mercy goes for a second. She goes, no, I'm going to stay with dad make sure he's okay. I was fine. She just thought, you know, she didn't want to go. And we were just talking. And she goes, how old were you the first time you came here? And I'm like, five, you know. And then I was remembering the fucking circus. The first time I went to the circus... You know, they give you these whistles, these these lights, and on a string, and you spin them around. I told you. And then the next year I went, when they turned the lights off, you hear the fucking thing. You hear kids getting hit in the head with the fucking lights. The next year I went back, and they had those little half-retarded helmets. At that time, they were like little ones and shit. But the circus was real at New York City. They didn't even have a net and shit at that time. If a fucking lion, if a if a... One of the guys fell off the top. You'd see the lion drag him off and shit. Oh, oh my God. It would help sweep him off. <laughs> you know, I started going to that place when I was young. I didn't know what that place was. And then as I got older, I got older and I was like, wow. And then when Michael Jackson came to town in 1984, it was my equivalent of like Led Zeppelin coming to town to shoot the movie in 75. They just locked up New York City. It was just locked up, Lee. I can't even describe what New York City was like that day. It was just locked up. Like 10 blocks around the garden, you couldn't move your fucking car. People were just jumping out of cabs and walking. That's that's how much intensity Michael Jackson brought to that fucking garden. Not in 81, but in 84. I went to see him both times. And it's crazy, not to derail you, but I just want to think about this first. Like, without the internet, 
that people went that crazy? Like, was it just in like the papers and then like on the radio? Like- papers, you knew. You you know, New York City is a big city. Mm-hmm. But it's a very small city. You know, I, like like I remember having friends that had friends. You know, when I was like in the eighth grade, that used to go to Keith Richards and Mick Jagger's building in the city. So people start to find out your hangouts. Oh, okay. And, you know, New York City's big, but it's very small, and and we're all cr- creatures of fucking habit. You know, so I don't even know what I was talking about. You were talking about the concert. You said it was it was like it was like Michael Jackson in '84. Like Michael Jackson, but it's like you didn't know, but you knew. So you you had you know you you looked at where the best hotel was in New York. And that's where you went looking for Michael Jackson. Somewhere where they allowed kids and giraffes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it, it was like everybody was in New York looking for Michael. I still remember Madonna, like Madonna crazy in New York City, like in 84. Like I remember these things. And it was like so hard to describe to people. That's when you get to see the real heartbeat that is New York City. Like those are the. Like when John Lennon got shot that Monday night football, that following Sunday, the city was locked up. The city was so locked up, I couldn't even get to the park. So instead, I went to the village. It's that type of fucking atmosphere, that type of energy. Let me tell you something. Now, we got there for the doors opening, and there were 30 people online. We cut That's the lines. Nice. We had clear. They got clear at the garden. So we whipped up that old app out of the phone, and we just showed it. We didn't even pay for it. We haven't had clear. We canceled it. Like the airplane clear? That's why. What's that? Like the air, the clear from the airport? They're having it at, at uh, oh, yeah, now? Yeah, Yankee Stadium. They got it a bunch of places now. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. That's so really cool. Clear, you go to certain games, cut the line, not get searched, you know, the whole fucking deal. So you, go, you got right in. Got right in, and we were like the first ones in our area. Like, I was like, what happened to this city? And it was a lot of young people, but the, the share was there. And that was interesting because the first three bands were like kid bands, you know, and the kids were dancing. I went downstairs and met with Jelly Roll then. I took my wife for the first band, the second band, and went downstairs and saw Jelly Roll and sat with him. We talked about the music, the dog. I congratulated him. And then we went back, and the girls were going crazy, all of them. And there were these two old gay guys. All right, New York City gay. See, again, I'm not putting nobody down. I'm just talking about there's like four generations of gayisms. (laughs) These are like the three, the third generation. The guys my age, maybe 67. Okay, that's a different type of gay dude, okay? (laughs) <laughs> the mentality, you don't even want to look at them because they, they'll suck they'll, they'll just look at you and you're sucking their dick subconsciously like that the savages they're mental savages they've been gay for 50 67 fucking years they know how it's done they could crack you know it's like nothing for them it's like me showing up to an open mic for 10 minutes i could do it with my eyes closed after 10 minutes i'm gonna have a problem but these two dudes wouldn't fucking <laughs> smile for the first three fucking bands okay I would sit there and just watch them, right? I would just sit there. And I got to tell you more. I would just sit, just to let you know, things have not changed in the Joey Diaz world. I'm looking at these two gay dudes, right? They're not even really good looking. They're just old. One of them is balding. The guy that was balding was the broad because he had the purse, right? He had like a little macho purse. (laughs) So I'm watching this whole thing go down because I got to report back to Eric, right? Right. So finally, Cher came on. These guys were furious the whole night. They kept looking at the kids. <laughs> they couldn't believe they were kids. You know, they were just fucking miserable. Two gay dudes that all are interested in was assholes and fucking share. Like, you could tell. When <laughs> shit came on, they got up out of their seats. They were jumping up and down. Oh, God. They were going fucking nuts. They had their phones out. <laughs> they were hugging each other. They were kissing each other. <sighs> they sang one fucking song. Ten minutes, right? Now, these tickets, I don't know what they cost. Cher got off. These two guys got up and fucking abandoned ship. That was it. crazy. Not even a smile on their faces after that. They went back to being miserable gay guys from the 60s. They got flashbacks. They got support groups of these fucking 
all the fags because nobody liked them in the 60s and 70s. They didn't get to talk to people till Madonna came out in 85. They saw some daylight. So, But then there was one kid that was driving me fucking crazy. Why? Three little chubby girls. I like, just so people know, you know, they were probably of the Jewish descent. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> right away, I don't like them because they're out on fucking Hanukkah night, right? Jumping up and down. But the thing that bothered me the most was the kid. The kid had to be 16, 17. He was crying and yelling more than the girls when people would perform to the point where he was taking his phone out and singing the lyrics to the phone. And he was Jewish, skinny, he had the hook nose, and he had the curly. <laughs> he had the curly fucking uh, Ari hair. I couldn't take it no more. So the one girl sang a song called Fruitcake. And I'm like, fruitcake. I'm calling him. <laughs> he ain't answering me. So finally, I take a piece of nicotine gum. He's sitting there looking at himself in between acts. And I just fling the nicotine gum. No, you didn't. Come on now. And it lands on his shoulder. Bro. <laughs> and he just looks at it. He knows he's getting hate mail. And this is just the beginning, right? <sighs> so after once fucking uh, Jelly Roll came on, he, did, he wasn't into Jelly Roll, him and the, the chubby girls. But when Reza came on, the, the sexy black girl, which Cassius Morris said to me to slip her, his number because he wanted to bust into that monkey, right? Cassius Morris <laughs> sent me a fucking thing. And she is very attractive, that girl Reza. When Reza was on, Reza, whatever her fucking name is. I have no idea. He was dancing and yelling again. Ah! Like, you know. <laughs> I'm surprised those two fags didn't take him home, like. Uh, they should have just tapped him on the shoulder. You want to come to the other side? Follow us out of here. Leave the, three little, leave the three little girls. Leave the candle. Take oh. the condom. You know what I'm saying? Leave the, <laughs> take the condom. Why can't why can't Jews go out on Hanukkah? Nothing. You're not supposed to stay in on Hanukkah. You could go out on Hanukkah, but you can't be jumping up and down like that, like a fucking you know, <laughs> you know. And finally, I took a piece of gum and I just flung it. And it bounced over his shoulder, went into his hair. And he oh. flung it out. And that was the end of that. After the show, I just walked out. And I'm like, I felt like grabbing him going, your cousins are fighting over there. <laughs> now in a fucking hole against a bunch of stink and debt and missiles. And you're over here jumping up and down, singing like a fucking mook de lure. It just burns me up, Lee. You know what I'm saying? I'm sorry. I get emotional. And that's what it is. If I saw anybody doing acting like that I, as a young kid, I'd be like, what the fuck, guy? You're with three fucking girls. You're not and even I, with the boys. You're with three girls ah, yelling like that. Come on. It's got to stop. This cannot continue. But I Look, think it means uh, the whole 18,000 people, the only people with testosterone was the security guys. Everybody else <laughs> had, had no testosterone. They had slippers on, whether they were six or 60. There was a man in there. I just took my test a couple of weeks ago, and I got a little high above average because I work my legs on it. You know, I massage the nutsack and keep it warm. <laughs> and that these helps. guys could not deal with my testosterone. I, I knocked my wife up at 50. I'm slinging fucking. I'll whack off and, and throw the cum against the wall, and it'll stick. I'm, you know, I'm still slinging heat. I'm fucking Cuban. We're primitive. We, we could, some, I can knock somebody up at 80 just by flinging <laughs> the eyeball. Well, you you talked about like at going to concerts and like going with like with Satan or the devil, whatever his name was. What would you have done at like sixteen if you saw that kid dancing and doing all oh, that stuff? <laughs> it would have been there was no police, there was no videos in those days. That's when you light a firecracker first. You send them like a little message. Bah! You always brought firecrackers to those concerts. You brought always. firecrackers? Always, but I gotta be. I never lit one till like maybe I don't. I forget what concert I finally lit one. Because if, oh, Ozzy at the garden, my friend was getting dry humped, right? A friend of mine didn't. He sat next to a guy away from us. And the guy started dry humping him. And he punched him. Security's coming. So, bah! That's the first time. But I did it after I saw a bunch of people blowing off smoke bombs at concerts in the New York, New Jersey area. And I forgot about it. And 30 years later, I would listen to fucking Jimmy Florentine on the radio. And he spoke about it. But that was him. I fucking almost died when I heard the story about he put a smoke bomb and the security guard caught him and he had to call his mom and he was stoned 
and his Holy mother shit. explained to him why your eyes so red, you know. I love that you brought firecrackers to a concert as a kid. Like the small, like I saw you that the other day. A fucking firecracker, screwdriver, a bottle opener. You brought what you could. All my friends would bring those little wine pouches that they'd hide. I fucking hated that shit. Acting like Moses with a little pouch. <laughs> you fucking Jesus drinking wine out of a fucking pouch at a concert. It's 90 fucking degrees out. You, you got your armpit on the fucking bottle. I don't want a sip of that shit. And they would pass it around like they were in the Old West. Get the fuck out of here. It's 1980. I just saw you eating some chick's ass the other night on 42nd Street. And you want to fucking share a glass with me. Did you? Because I saw the uh, the Instagram you did with Mercy, which was great. But you, I, you, you didn't look like super fucked up to go to this one. Or did you? Did you get? I had kids with me. Right. So I couldn't go and fucking, I, I couldn't do edibles. Like, I think I ate, like, maybe 200, 300 <laughs> balance out. I ate one of those Fung, Fung Factory Farm cookies, which is three mm-hmm. grams of mushroom. And I didn't want to bring a chocolate bar or nothing because it would melt. So I just brought fucking, uh, I brought uh, the gummies, the cherry flavored gummies, which is four grams. I gave two of those things away, but I ate the other eight. So hold on. So just to clarify, a light night for you is 300 milligrams and about six grams of mushrooms? Yeah. <laughs> that seems about <laughs> Listen, I'm too old to go back to the old church. We oh, all. Yeah. It just wouldn't even fit into the fucking agenda I'm living now. But if I know I don't have, like, tomorrow, I got something at 9, and I got something at 10. And I got something at 1 and something at 2. My day is tremendous tomorrow. I ate a little mushroom tonight. I'm not going to lie. And I didn't eat no cookie or no gummy. I ate a mushroom cap. Oh, that's all. You know what? I don't, that's the one thing I really like about them. You don't really get hungover. No. So like, tonight, not even a little bit. Tonight, I'll eat a cap. I'll eat, you know, I put down a 1,000 milligrams. I think I opened up with eight, and then I dropped another two out of respect for fucking Christmas. And, uh, you know, that's where I am tonight. I did a that's couple awesome. of pockets with some new weed I got, and that's where oh. I am right now at this point in my life. You know, I'm okay with that. Oh, yeah. I, I just love it. Like Because I knew when you said you didn't take edibles. I was like, I think. Saturday, you know, night, Saturday night, I had a shot of something. Well, I'm lying to you. Friday night, I had a shot of uh, tequila after the jelly roll set. You did? Yeah, why not? You only walk on one leg. I don't think I've ever seen you take a shot. Oh, this was a good shot, too. And let me tell you something. Like I got, I made it back to the car. I didn't feel it that night. I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't feel it. And from the adrenaline and walking and stuff, it probably just burnt off. i got to be honest with you. Like, 2 o'clock Saturday, I was like, I, gotta, I feel a little hungover. And I'm like, that's weird because I didn't drink. I'm like, oh, shit. That shot of tequila was real. That's crazy. One I wasn't shot of tequila. Like, no, it didn't affect me at all. No, but no but you, you felt a little bit like, you know. I drank the night before. And then Saturday night, I went out with my buddies. And for dessert, they passed out like fucking these drinks that would just, it, would t- it looked like peppermint schnapps, but it was very almondy. Nice. And I did one of those. And I also did a glass of sangria to open up the dinner to get my appetite going because I wasn't I like that sang- hungry. I like sangria. Red sangria? Well, the red and the white at this place, Segovia and Munaki. Nice. It was oh, a real... Yeah. I don't know what the problem was this weekend. It was very... Like, I didn't go to the garden thinking that I was going to go through that minute when I just sat there and I realized how many times I had been in there, how lucky I was to... I saw Michael Jordan play there as a rookie against oh, Bernard shit. King. And, you know, I, I just remember so many things. Michael Corrin from Jersey City, I went to see him play at the Garden when he played for North Carolina. You know, the Sixers against the Knicks on Christmas Day when my teacher got thrown out of there. You know, there's so many memories I had to that place. You know, I probably went to the Meadowlands five times to watch a concert. And I'm probably exaggerating. I saw Ted. I saw Michael Jackson out there in 84. Maybe somebody else. I never was out there as much as I was at the Garden, you know. And then Saturday, I went out with these dudes that, you know, since 
you know, I've known these guys since 1974, 75. Wow. I've known these guys. So that's 48 years, you know, just knowing these guys. And you look at them and you see, you you know these guys. So you look at them and you see them young while you're talking to them and you see what they've become, you know, and we got there at six and we didn't leave till 10. Holy shit. That's a long time, especially for you. Dog. It was that entertaining. It was that entertaining. Everybody was talking shit, telling stories about, because remember out of the six guys that were there, four of us were in the same seventh and eighth grade, except one of the guys transferred to downtown his eighth grade year. And what made you have this dinner? I mean, it sounds great, but like you, this is not something you do. We always, we've been getting together since I got back here. Really? Yes. I thought this was like a holiday thing. This was uh, maybe the fourth time in three years. Nice. We've gotten together. We've been to Steakhouse 85 twice. We've been to the other place once. We've been to, we went somewhere else in Red Bank and then this place. We go to the stuff. We go to Steakhouse 85 across the street from the Stress Factory. That's a place with the good burgers, right? Like, and that's a crazy thing to say, but you said it was like a great burger. Great. But then around the corner is called the Stage. And that motherfucker's got the burger and they have Italian upstairs and it's a steakhouse downstairs. Ooh. And upstairs. And the last time we were there, Lee, they split a burger. It was like, or six, and we're sitting there talking, maybe seven of us. And we told the guy, we go, listen, we all want steak, but we got to do the burger. He goes, that happens all the time. I'll bring you four, two burgers chopped in eights. So it was four pieces for a burger. Right. You got a little bit of the burger. You got a steak. You got spaghetti. I mean, these dinners are heavy. That's why I, I, I had to drive 55 minutes, so I couldn't take a 1,000 milligrams. <laughs> that never stopped you before. So yeah, but this is a new world. So I smoked, right. <laughs> I smoked a little bit. And once I got that, I couldn't smoke. I couldn't go into that restaurant smelling like reefer. I've been going there for 40 years, you know. You don't think they know? You don't think you ever went in there smelling like weed? Well, they're like a very nice place. They us out 30 years ago. They threw you out. They, they didn't throw us out. They asked us to leave. We were too loud and they knew we were doing blow in the bathroom and yelling and screaming. So we brought it up the other night. We brought it up to them. We were like, hey, man, remember 30? He was like, nah. We, the, son, we, the son goes, I'm 31. I go, yeah, when you were a year old, your dad threw us out of here one night. Asked us. He didn't throw us out. He just came over and he goes, guys, what the fuck? That night, it must have been 12 of us. Holy shit. And he's like, guys, come on. You got to go. Come on. And, and you, were, you were what? In your like, late 20s, early 30s? I was 31. I'd come back here to do comedy after I got divorced. I came back here. But enough about me. What happened with you this weekend? You were all excited about a show on Sunday, fucking in some Chinese restaurant. Oh, yeah. I had a, I had a great comedy weekend. Like, a really, I, I, A, have gotten better about reaching out to people. I just reached out to a, a booker who's been great. And I got, I just randomly got a show on Friday, which was awesome. Okay. Um, at a club that I hadn't done. And I, I, I called you before because like I'm just really, I think I'm a pretty good, I really do think I'm doing pretty well as a feature, but as a host, I'm struggling and I'm not used to it. So I called you for some advice. You and I went, volunteer. all these open mics you go to, you got to volunteer host. Okay. That's it. Just say, I want to host. I'll be here all three hours. 80 people. You got exercise that night. Up and down, up and down. It gives you 80 shots to try 80 lines or, you know, just kept get, just volunteer hosting. Yeah. It, it, people, when, it, people always go away from what they're not good at. Yeah. If this is what you want to do for a living. Mm -hmm. You got to be good at Because somewhere along the line, it may not be today, but nine years from now, you'll be in L.A. and they're going to call you to do a fucking hosting gig. And you're going to be kind of lost. You're going to be, you you know, it's going to take you a while. I'd rather you fucking work that. The, the, the thing I had that was lucky was my first two years, I had a hosting job once a week. Right. And I still didn't know what I was doing. But then I started watching uh, Def Comedy Chat. Okay. I started watching Joe Torrey. He's really but, good? 
he was good, but the best host I ever saw, the guy who made me want to host was D.L. Hughley. Wow, okay. D.L. Hughley hosted BET, uh, uh, whatever it was called, on HBO one night. And he got a standing ovation from the hosting. Holy shit. That's powerful, man. And that made me go, whoa, I get it now. Because while you're hosting, all you're thinking about is getting to fucking the headliner spot. I want you to think about hosting. And, and it's hosting as a living. You're a quarterback of a team. Okay? You're the one that controls the tempo. You control the clock. Clock. If the fucking guy goes up and does 30 and he's a magician and people fall asleep, I hope you didn't do your good material the first five minutes because now you got to have to bring them fucking back. Okay. And so on and so forth. That was actually a question that I like. I ran into it a couple of shows ago. If I'm the host, I'm always worried about, like, they don't want me to do time in between the feature and the headliner. Just get the headliner up there. Yeah, okay. I had a show a couple of well, like, They won't. We ain't listening. You're not going to go up there and read the Bible for fucking 15 minutes. You're going to go up there and hit them with a quick 28-second joke to get them back. But again, you got 28 seconds. Who knows how to do this? You're looking at me, you, and a bunch of comics that listen to this are going, what the fuck are you talking about, Joey? Exactly. If I say to you, go up there and bring up the feature, let's keep it going for fucking Joey Diaz. He did great tonight, even though I ate a bag of dicks. <laughs> right. right? And you saw he did great tonight. Look at the audience and go. <laughs> he did great tonight, right? Whatever the fuck you usually do. And then you just say something. Listen, I'm going to bring up the headline real quick. Let's let's give him a round of applause. He's in the way back there getting ready or whatever. Don't even say round of applause. And then hit them with something. Hit them with okay. something you saw on the news. Anybody watch Eyewitness News tonight? Anybody see the Mexican kid that got stuck in the sewer? <laughs> Boom. That's it. That was it. You condensed the whole bit into one fucking line. You don't have time to go in your little green room or your little computer and hit the click for jokey poos. This has to be constantly working. And that's what hosting does to you. It involves you in the fucking game. When you're a feature, you're like, my job is to go up there, blow out the headline, then go drink and meet broads. Not you. This makes you pay attention to what's going on in the fucking game. And then when you evolve into movies and TV shows, when you become something and you get to a trailer and they go to you, Mr. Syatt, we'll bring you what you want. You go, no, 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 no. The first thing I want to do is go on the set for an hour and see what's going on. I want to fucking feel the tempo of the game. Same thing as hosting. You just took comedy and took it into the next level. And that's what every step of comedy is. If you're thinking about the next level, it's the prerequisite that you don't know about. You know, like when you take college algebra and they're mm -hmm. like, prerequisite, two and two is four, breathe in a glass. <laughs> they're prerequisites for everything, guys especially when you want to do this as a fucking living. Now, am I going to tell you, I knew I wanted to do that. Listen, when I was hosting, I could have been in jail any day. You know what I'm saying? Right. Up to 2000, my comedy career was every time I did a set, you better do well because you don't know if you're going to be in jail or not. Wow. For something stupid, drugs, a fist fight, you stole something, you know. I never trusted myself. And then when I made it to 2000, I don't know why. I still stole lighters from 7-Eleven, but I was, I had a, I had more lighters than 7-Eleven from the one on Curson. <laughs> the football ones? The football ones. I had every team except like three of them. They tried to rip me off fucking bit. But, you know, you, you, you just, you know, when I was at the store and I had the opportunity to host, I knew the previous hosts and what they did with their careers. Freddie Soto was about to hit, you know, and the big host that hosted at the store was the guy who died, that he was the host of America's Most Wanted. <clears throat> the com Another host that the comedy store had on Monday nights, Dave Letterman. Really? Yeah, he hosted the fucking open mic. So I want the young comics to think about this shit. This is something that 
takes you, if you want to do this as a career and you want to do, to hit every single aspect that you could reach as your career, fucking, you got to learn every fucking position. You know, you know what made Prince good? What? That he could play every instrument on that fucking album. That's true. And it's, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm a little ashamed, but it's honest. I did think about like this week. I was like, if they asked me to host, maybe I'll ask them if I could just not host. Cause it's like, it, 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 it I, I hate when I don't do well. It fucking burns me up. Yeah. What do you think? I enjoyed it. You think anybody likes to bomb? You think people are like, yeah, ma, I'll eat the spaghetti and then in an hour after I bomb, I'll come back and we'll play <laughs> Monopoly. Right. I, bomb. I don't want to play Monopoly. I want to fucking shoot myself. Right. More coke, but what you're not thinking about right now after you bomb is that it's just a number getting closer to what you want to do as a as a living. It's it's like going up to somebody and trying to sell a fucking cell phone, and they say no, and then the, the guy next to you sells three of them, and then this guy sells them, and you have an eight day streak. If you keep putting your heart into it, it's gonna turn, and that's the same thing with comedy. You're gonna go through dog. You still even haven't gone through that spell. What? Oh no! What? What spell? You know, there's a spell comics go through where they're driving to a gig in Rhode Island and they hit a deer. You, you haven't even got into that venue yet. Oh, I'm worried <laughs> about that too. I have a word about like, what happens if I get into an accident and I'm late for the show. Then then fuck it. Then you're late for the show. You got into an accident. You hit a deer. You'll see him next time. The gas you paid that comes out of your pocket. You learned the lesson. Next time, get a tank. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I, I fucking worry about everything. But I, uh, the uh, the rest of the weekend was great. Sunday was honestly one of my better days of comedy being back in Massachusetts. Because yeah, I had a 1 p.m. show <coughs> at a Chinese restaurant like an hour outside of Boston. And I was going expecting no, no one to be there and it to be terrible. And it was one of the better shows I've done since I've been back. It was packed. The woman who put it together got a ton of people there. They were there to see comedy. Like the people were fun. The the crowd was cool. And like then I got Chinese food after. It was fucking awesome. And it was just, and it's weird because I went from hosting and not doing great to literally at a Chinese restaurant with with Christmas decorations up. And I'm like I like they they loved. I did great. I had a great show. And then you went to see Jezelnik, and that was another yeah. invitation. Yeah, that was, I've only seen him, it's crazy that I never saw him at the store. And I've seen his specials, um, but I didn't really know much about him. And my cousins hit me up and just asked if I wanted to go. And A, and I'm sorry, I think her name was Kelly Ryan. I think the feature, she did great, but the only way I could describe Jezelnik, because I've been thinking about it today, was every joke. He had a balloon and was blowing it up, and because like I could feel like the audience, like they were just waiting for him to say something fucked. Like they're just waiting for it, and then and then and like he sometimes it takes a little longer, and then when he did it, it would pop, and the place would go nuts. Like it was just so like there was, I I, I don't want to say it's scripted because I don't think it's necessarily scripted, but every joke is so greatly written. Like there's not an ounce of like an extra word anywhere. Rip. It, is it okay? It, yeah. it, whatever he is, it's it he's a great perfectionist, brother. You know, he's very funny, very dry, mm -hmm. very dark. And what I respect about Jezelnik, the truth is, anything he puts on video is gonna hit because he puts two or three years into that special. Yeah, he just doesn't pull what these other guys are doing eight months, and there's another special. And they're talking about the same shit, the same way a lot of comics do. Well, it's not the 15 years you got to run out of fucking material. So you got to keep it fresh. You know, after right. you change. So your point of view changes. You know, everything changes. So you cannot beat yourself up. And even with writing, you're going to have a period leave where you're going to write some bad fucking jokes. Yep. And then there's going to be a period where you're going to write some great jokes. And there's times, I'll tell you when it gets worse, when you don't know what's good or what's bad. And you put out like an album, like Eating Pussy with Asthma, that album. <clears throat> but again, it was rushed. We didn't know in those days. 
We thought the material was good. You know, this is the shit you learn at the 20 year mark. <clears throat> so right now, the best thing you could do, my friend, is just keep getting on stage. If, oh, you, I, if you bomb, you get in the car and you go to another comedy club. Yeah, it was Jezel Nick was so good that I went to the the there's an open mic on, on Sundays in Worcester. And I went at like 10 o'clock because he was just he was so good. And it was crazy because he's not super high energy and like I'm not. And then he also he did something that I've seen that I've never seen anyone do. He shit on Boston. Like he basically said, fuck you to ever. And people were like, yeah, like it was like, like no other comic could do that. Like he was basically, it was just, it's amazing what he's able to do. He's a gifted dude, you know, and uh, he takes his time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a really good fucking comedy show. He's a complete, you know, now you see the differences between mm -hmm. him and Bill Burr. Two great comics, just two different fucking him and Chappelle, you know, not, there's a lot of great work out there. But you see who's putting in the work and you see who's just shuffling out material. It, it, become, it becomes a cash register. I would do the same. If Netflix kept calling me every eight months, <laughs> I'd be going on there singing songs. I'd have a band by now and a fucking harmonica. But real quick, here's to an ad from BetterHelp. Hey, this episode of The Check-In is brought to you by BetterHelp. I love BetterHelp. Why? Because I used them. Listen, the holidays are here. We all get stressed out sometimes. You don't have to keep it to yourself. Get online therapy with BetterHelp. Whether you're working through something really serious or you just want somebody to talk to, everybody needs a friend. And sometimes the cat don't talk back to you. If it does, you got problems for real. But anyway, BetterHelp makes life easier. And it's simple as that. That's it. I love BetterHelp. I was with them for like a year. It was tremendous. They gave me uh, uh, little drills, skills to cope with, to learn me, you know, how to control my anxiety. And here we are. Here we are. That therapy is completely online, so you can meet with a counselor whenever, whatever works for you. You can meet with your therapist on a video call, on a phone call, even a message. Listen, they even have two cans with a string in the middle. They'll get you the help that you need. To get started, take a quick quiz on their website. <laughs> take a quick quiz on their website, and BetterHelp experts will match you with a therapist. If their first pick isn't you, you can switch at any time, no question asked. Do yourself a favor. You want to be giggling like me? Get BetterHelp. They helped me. I was for a year. I didn't know what was going on. BetterHelp is tremendous. It's the season of giving. Give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Trust me. We all need a little somebody to talk to. Visit betterhelp.com slash Diaz, D-I-A-Z, today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash Diaz. BetterHelp wants to offer you a Merry Christmas. And remember, if they talk back, just run out of the room. It's over. BetterHelp loves you. We're back. All right. Don't forget for the holidays, it's rough this time of the year. If you need somebody to talk to, a shoulder to lean on, something, contact BetterHelp. Go to BetterHelp.com. They're going to help you out. I know Today I was talking on the Patreon podcast about it. I know this time of the year. This time of the year, either you're jumping up and down or you fucking got your dick in the dirt. There's no in between. Either you're broke and, and people have to learn one thing that some of the best Christmases I had when I, when I was fucking dirt broke. That's when you saw what Christmas was about, the humanity. You know, people saying, hey, Joey, I know you smell. You've been sleeping on a rocket ship with piss, but come over, wash your neck, and you can eat some turkey. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so I was talking about that. So, yeah, the holidays are fucking, you know. I mean, my agent called me today. They close on Friday. Oh, yeah. It's dead right now. Like if, I was thinking about that today because I have a friend who's looking for a job. And I told them, I'm like, listen, don't even bother right now. Like, people are checked well, out. Well, if you go to any of these department stores right now, they'll hire you for 10 days. Oh, yeah, like that kind of a job, you know, yeah. You don't have to be fucking broke right now. Everybody's looking for something. You got a shovel, take down the Christmas decorations. There's going to be a parade in New York City. You could get 2000 I don't know what my friend was picking up there for cleaning up the fucking sidewalk, garbage, and sticks. You know, there's a bunch of hustles now. 
This is the you type can't. of kid that if you want work, if you really want work, if you want somebody to give you 15, 16 an hour, go to a Coles, go to any of those places. You know, they're stocking. Dude, I did it but when I when I got back from LA before I had a my day job. I did, I only did it once, but I still have the app. There's you can deliver Amazon packages and they pay you like 25, 30 an hour. It's pretty, I mean, it's not like consistent, but you could if you have an SUV, you can deliver Amazon packages. In your it's area? Pretty, yeah. And it, like I, I only did it once and it, it was it couldn't be it took it took me like two hours. Instead of the four hours they said it should take, because it was I got lucky and they were all right next to each other. There's a lot of like it's pretty crazy what you can do on your own schedule. Like you're not gonna get rich, but between like Uber delivering shit, like you can do a lot of shit by yourself with your phone. I had a friend, he's two years younger than me. We grew up together. I was just talking to him about a week ago, and he told me that he got rid of his job. He didn't want to do it anymore. He, he couldn't take seven more years there. He said he got an early retirement. They're not going to start paying him till he's 62, and he's okay with that. And he got a job driving an Uber in an area where he's putting down 250 a day the last couple fucking weeks, two weeks. He's making better money than if he had a job. He's a, he's a fucking stalker like me. He, he wakes up some nights at 4 in the morning to pee, and he says he gets he stay, smokes a cigarette. He goes, fuck it. I get my, right. he goes, I get my car at 4 to 30, and in five minutes, I got a hit to go to Newark Airport. Yep. Oh, yeah. Especially the airport ones around there. So he, he goes from all, I know he don't live, he lives an hour from me. But even like anywhere, like around like Newark or New York, I, I had an Uber driver in Kansas City, and I thought about you because he broke it down for me. He's like, I, what I do is when I take someone from the airport, I ask them if they're, like, if they're in town for a conference. And then I look up that conference and I see what time the things get out. And if you like, you can definitely make money doing that. That's pretty cool. And it's, it, it's nice because you, you have complete freedom. You can Listen, turn it off whenever you want. Right now, like for people, like, I'm, a, I'm a comic. I can't find any work. I'm a musician. I can't. Right now is the best time to be a comedian starting or a fucking musician. Listen, when I fucking started comedy, I had to fucking go into a, an office and sell insurance from five to nine. I had a, you found part time jobs, but you had it, you know, for you to have your own car today as a comedian, like me, if I was 30, if this was 1993, and I really wanted to develop as a comedian, do as many sets as I could, I'd either go to two places, Austin, Texas, or New York. If you're spotless clean, come to New York. They'll love you. You'll be a genius in a year because half the clubs are very woke. Right. I'll, I never thought about that. Yeah. It's not woke in Jersey, in uh, Texas. Oh, yeah. In Austin, it's not woke. They won't allow it. You know, Rogan, those guys, like, we're pushing the fucking envelope. We don't give a fuck who's. And right now, you go to Austin right now, and as a five year comic, you could borrow the money from grandma, ask her, Grand, what are you going to leave me the inheritance? <laughs> don't get too so I get an apartment. You know, let me tell you something apartments are not cheap in Austin. She no. would have to live outside of Austin now. But still, driving an Uber to the airport, that airport's packed off fucking day. People going down there daily to look at houses, homes, to see what the fucking muscle's about. They already went to Nashville. They've already been to L.A. and got mugged by a homeless guy. It's time to go see what Austin's about, you know? Right. And, dog, thinking of, I mean, I was thinking about, the other day I was in that limo, and I was talking to the guy, and I go, I drove the limo, and he goes, how was it back then? And I go, I, I started at 4.30, and I, I picked a box up at Englewood Clips, and I would take it to New York City, the Eyewitness News. It was like the news clips or something. I, I never looked in there. And I would drop it off, and they paid me like $45 for that run. It was a quick $45. It was every day. And then from there, I had the whole, I had their car, and I'm in New York City. Oh, shit. The only thing that sucked was parking. Right. That would have eaten up that 45 bucks real quick. Real quick. So you had to drive around, find a spot, and then I would run in and sign up for an open mic. That's how I learned all the open mics, by that fucking car. I would get myself two open mics. It'd be 930, 
and I get a call to go to Kennedy Airport twice. Go pick up this guy and then go back in an hour and pick up another guy. Perfect. I just made a buck fifty for the night, plus he's gonna tip me. So I would go up, pick him up, come back. What I'm trying to say is I had options driving. Today, you have more options driving. You got DoorDash, you got Uber Eats, you got Uber, you got, you know, you have all these ways as a young comic to make a living and practice your shit in the car. You would, that you would test it out on people? Why not? You're going to get, you, you're fight, fighting for a tip, right? Right, I guess. And you're not going to, you ever get in a car with an Uber driver that don't speak your language? And the whole time he's got an earphone on, like fucking, like he's Janet Jackson's assistant manager. <laughs> and three times while you're driving with him in the fucking Uber, you actually look at him and go, what? He ain't talking to you. He's talking to, <laughs> he's talking to fucking Hamas over there. Whatever the fuck he's saying. Think about right. it. That guy. Now, think about it. I got an Uber driver maybe two years ago after the pandemic. I was going somewhere. He offered me a water. He spoke to me. He, he offered me candy. There's candy in the back. There's hand sanitizer. You know, wh what kind of music do you want? This is a fucking Uber X. I'm a fucking fat fuck. He didn't know that. He didn't know I was a comedian or nothing. Right. At the end, he asked me. He goes, you look familiar? But I go, yeah. And he goes, oh, I thought you were one of the guys in The Sopranos. But still, the guy offered you water. There was candy. There was sanitizer. If you're just nice in this fucking Uber business and you crack a joke, God forbid they smoke dope. They could pick somebody up at the airport and, you know, they got no weed. And all of a sudden you hit them with a fucking number and you tell them to take one to go. What's that guy not going to do for you? Jesus Christ. Yeah, you get a lot of tips if you're giving away joints as a tip, as a bonus. Never. You're giving away your, your entertainment. In comparison to what you're going up against in New York, people not talking to you. People right. look at you like you got three heads in a fucking cab. I need that. Oh, I, I can't. It's a whole different system in New York City. Like you have to get like a taxi license. It's because like, it, you can make money, money there. But that's for like it's. It you is pretty money, cool. You you got competition, right? The, the probable odds of you getting hit like every three weeks. You got to argue with some guy who don't have insurance and he don't know English and shit. Most likely, fuck. Yeah, that's great. So that's what you would do now if you were if you were thirties. You'd do that. Like, it's just, it is pretty cool. It's um. Do you remember when you made the like the full leap to not having like any sort of day job? Had to be about two thousand two, when I said, you know, I'm not making it as a comic. I'm not making enough money as a comic. But I'm also not making enough money doing whatever the fuck I'm doing. And I'm doing it together. So after a while, if you're giving something else 50% of your energy, I always sold stuff. So I'm thinking. And you're doing comedy. And look, once I added the sales to the comedy, that's when everything happened. So you have to look at your account, your situation. You have to plan. You know, one thing I did as a comic in the beginning was I didn't have much money in 1990. When Tribble called me, I didn't have much money. And I remember that I looked at what I brought in, and I was honest with myself. My rent was 400 bucks, Lee, 28 years ago in Boulder, you know. <clears throat> I didn't have a car payment. I don't know if I paid for insurance. I doubt it. I put gas in the car. I had a pager. I didn't go into this with a $3,000 or $4,000 nut. I knew this is bare bones. Jesus. Grandma gave you 1000 Mom gave you 500 This is bare bones. Your uncle gave you a Nissan from 2008 with 150,000 miles. You take care of that car. You got another 150,000 miles. So all you got to do is pay for insurance. You put a blanket in there. You put everything you think of in that fucking car. Blankets, can openers, a basketball, a frisbee, another blanket, anything that you think, band aids, and you start doing comedy. If this is what you really want to do, you know, think of the great comics, what they did. You think I wrote this book on comedy? I remember hearing stories about 
Mitch Hedberg and Chart Hogan getting in a car and going from New York to L.A. doing guest sets in clubs, doing 30 guest sets in a week and, and getting eight weeks of work. Wow. You know? Not everybody had the same path. Fucking Doug Stanhope went to San Francisco. He was living in his car. And the day of the contest, somebody broke into his car and stole his clothes. Holy he went, shit. He went to a thrift store. He bought a suit. And he went in there and won. With comedy, you have to learn the other thing that's in your way. There's two things in your way with comedy. You and adversary. And adversity. Because shit's going to fucking happen. Shit's going to happen to throw you off your game. The universe takes care of you in more ways than you'll ever fucking know. And when they throw a little, how about I got arrested in, in Idaho and I had a show at nine o'clock and I got to the show at 10 after nine, like nothing happened. I don't, I, I, I'm not trying to, did, did you hit someone with a, a, a tray of food? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> what is that adversity? I shoplifted a tent and I tried to bring it back. Oh, the t- that was where the tent was. Okay, I was trying to think of what Idaho was. It's fu- that is fucked up though that you'll get. So after that, I'm like, I can't trust myself to fucking not be in jail one of these days in one of these towns. What happens if you pull out? You got a gram of coke, and you, you, the person who's driving is drinking. I'm going to jail. So, right, you have all this adversity in front of you, and then you have your own demons. But. With comedy, the demons got nothing to do with you if you still write and push forward. If you let the demons get you, I mean, listen, the demons will get you after a while. The demons will always get you if you let them. But for me, the demons went away the more I progressed in comedy. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, they started going away, started going away. And you're always going to have two or three of them in there, but you learn to cope with them. You open up the closet once a month. You go, hello. <laughs> It's it's to, to to get humbled like it's it's kind of scary for me right now in a way in a good way like I'm it's exciting but like I look at all the comics that I got to meet and that I like and then I look at like some that I meet either featuring or at other shows and they're very funny but they didn't they're not touring they're not at that level or the level that I want to be at. And it's just like, what did they do wrong, like, or or what did they, what did these other people do right? Like, it's just, it's a, it's a big toss up. If I'm ever gonna quote unquote make it, I know that can change for anyone, but that's like to even be a working comedian is a big toss up. What people don't understand is that when you're getting to that feature act, when you're getting to that, beginning to get in there, you're feeling good about yourself. But you're getting a lot of negative feedback from younger comics that they blame the world for everything. There's people who just blame the world for everything. They did this to me. He didn't like me. So you're going to go in there one day and go, this weekend I'm working for Joey Diaz. He's got a club in Boston. And some guy's going to go, fuck that dude. I went in there and killed. And he never brought me back. Now, you've known this guy for three months. He's never got a laugh. Right. <laughs> You follow me? Yeah. So you're going to have a lot of negativity. I mean, for me, in the beginning, it's just different clubs and what people will tell you. But while they're telling you all the negativity, all you're thinking about is the sets. I'm going to do five sets in five, in three nights. I'm going to make $400, and I'll live with that. No matter what this guy is telling you, I've been through way worse. Right. And then after right. I became a feature and I started headlining and touring the West Coast. Oh, my God, Lee. I mean, 60% of the comics I work with destroyed L.A. You're never going to make it. Don't even try it. I've been there for eight years. I never got a spot at the improv yet. I go every Sunday. I put my name in the hat. But then you see these guys, and you see how they, you know, they're tearing out. Oh, you got to be gay to be in Hollywood. And you want to smack them in the mouth. What are you talking about? I'm the opposite of fucking gay. And I right. love it. I'm trying to get ahead, so I got to love it there. It's a land of opportunity for me. But if somebody came on to you and you sucked their dick and didn't get the payoff, that ain't my problem. You bumped into the wrong Harvey Weinstein. You know? That's- so then you get into all that negativity. There's always going to be so much negativity, and, and that's cut, tied with mental health. 
So as they're telling you all this bad shit, you're looking at them going, I'm sleeping in my car, buddy. I live in my car. I ate a subway for lunch and dinner, and you're trying to tell me that this guy, fuck you. I'm going to do it better than you did. You went in there unprepared. You started drinking at the bar. You thought you were fucking Johnny Gambino. I'm, gonna, I'm not doing that. I'm going in there as a professional. And that's the problems that you have. You're going to run into it every time you say something. I'm going to Austin to do Rogan's Room. Well, fuck him, man. I did Kill Tony, and I didn't get my deal from CBS. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. It's uh, I'm, it's just crazy. It's, uh, it was a cool week. I, I feel like I learned a lot this week. It's funny. I got to tell you, I think I told you the other day that Jelly Roll, I mean, the when when Cher went up, mm-hmm. two of the moms were crying and the gay dudes were crying. And I didn't say nothing. You know, sometimes people move you to tears. Sometimes I know I get moved to tears a lot. And when Jelly Roll came up and he was singing uh, Need a Favor, you know, I tell you, man, I got emotional. And also, I'm like, you know what? You know what's crazy about me? I got unfinished business. You know? I go, if I start getting on stage this month, maybe I could start touring again, and maybe next year I could sell this fucking garden out. I really thought about that. And when I went down to see Jelly, I told him, I go, you inspired me a little bit, brother. That was fucking great. Because I know where you came from. You know, you really get to know people. I got home, put ice on my knee, put ice on my ankle, went to bed, went to a kid's basketball game. I came in here, I go, all right, let's write some jokes. <laughs> I'm like, fuck that shit. You know, I got, mo- he inspired me for a couple of minutes. And I think it's because I know how much work is involved. And I just don't have 10 hours a day to become a great comic again. I wish I did. I take naps in the afternoon now. I'm up at 6 a.m., 5 a.m., you know. Because I know how much work goes into this process. And you and I, I'm the type of guy that I like to check on people from time to time. Right. And what they're doing. And I check on the people that were the complainers. Really? Yeah. I check on the people who said negative things. Like at the comedy store, at the improv, or And these guys just kept their mouth shut. If they would have kept that, even a guy like me, I'm a fucking criminal. And I kept it together at the store. And I kept it together at the improv. And I kept it together at the Laugh Factory. And then for many years, I went to theaters and clubs. Not a fucking complaint, you know? But it's, uh, it's just crazy that these guys go into these places and they think they're fucking Belushi. And then they want to come back. Like, listen, there's a people, a lot of people from the old days didn't rehire me, no matter how many tickets I was selling. But wow. it was very interesting to see. And these guys were always complaining in LA about something. And you check on what they're doing now, and they're still doing backyard comedy shows. They're still they're living in Podunk towns, doing like he shows that you're like, so you complained about all that to go back to this? Right. Yeah, there's a lot of that. And I feel really bad because they just didn't wait for the miracle to happen. And listen, you can't go from being a waiter and doing spots at Vinny's Landing in L.A. to, you know, it's not going to happen that way. I never saw it. I never saw it. I mean, we have a new process now. You know, for years, people became YouTube stars. Now we got TikTok stars. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I'm always happy when somebody makes it, especially when somebody tricks their way in. I tricked my way in. Kim Kardashian tricked their way in. When you really look at successful people, they trick their way in, you know. But then at some point, you have to cover the spread. So you tricked your way in. Now, what can you, now what are you going to do? It's like I tell people, so you got Johnny Carson. You got a fucking spot on Johnny Carson. You're only thinking about the spot. I'm thinking about, I know I'm going to destroy the fucking show. What's your next move? 
You always have, as a comic, you got to be looking at that little move, not the garden. Don't come to me when you're still sending out tapes. You know, you can't get, <laughs> and say, you know, I see the garden in my future. Shut the fuck up. I want you to worry about the thing in front of you. You know, for me, it was always like the improvs. The comedy store was always seemed so far away when I first started comedy. But the improvs had 22 clubs. At the time, maybe eight of them. I knew that one of them would take me. Do you know what I'm saying? Is this all from sales? Like, like looking ahead, like your next focus on your next goal. Like that was what you just said was pretty big to me. Like folk, like what, like what you're going to. It's about fucking life. Comedy is down and fucking dirty. It's about life like anything else. And you're always trying to break in, but you're breaking in, but always thinking about after you break in, what are you going to do when you get there? What good is it if I can break into a bank if I can't open up a safe? What am I going to do? Wait outside the door and wait for <laughs> God to open up the safe? Right. I, my brain doesn't think like that, I guess. And it just, like I, it makes total sense. And I I need to start thinking like that. And I, I you do it a little bit. It's not your fault that you don't think that way. It's not your fault. You're not. You're still putting the pieces together. I don't expect you to think that way. I should expect you. I expect you to know that I think that way. Because I saw it happen in front of my eyes. I saw Chelsea happen. Chelsea Handler. She was opening for a town. Got on the show, you know, playing pranks. There's, there it is. I saw Josh Wolf take off in front of my eyes. I saw Ralphie May blow up on Last Comic Standing. You know, you heard all the stories. I saw Joe Rogan go from news radio to Fear Factor to... So I, I want people to know there's always possibilities if you do the work. But most important, I saw myself do it. I would think about things and go, yeah, maybe. And then we're halfway there. Well, I always knew I was going to get here because I kept doing my job, but silently I was actually going for that thing. I just didn't tell you. It's none of your business what I'm going for. It's my thing. I don't need you Lee going, whatever happened with the longest yard, asshole, you lost it to that fat fuck. This is my thing, and I'm going to work on it as hard as I can to get that. I think the comics take... A lot of bad chances in L.A. You saw it. What about the guy who shot the special? And then it was going to go on Showtime, his friend. And then he went to put it up, and there was an air conditioner behind him that kept making noise, and nobody could hear the audience laugh. Everybody thought they were going to beat the system. Shooting my own specials and doing this. When it's time to shoot your own specials, somebody will let you fucking know. <laughs> and then you can put it on YouTube and not worry about oh. it. Uh, you know, but that's what I saw. I saw a lot of people working hard, but not working smart. I saw Ralphie go from a fucking one bedroom apartment to a mansion up on the hill. I, I saw these things. I saw myself going from a one bedroom apartment with nine cats to a house in New Jersey. And the ability to pay for it and years of doing stand up. And, you know, did you ever, you thought when I first started doing comedy, theaters were in my, I was thinking about theaters? Well, let me ask you this. At my level, at five years, what was your dream? Did you have a comedy dream? My dream was to go on tour. My dream was to do a tour just to get in a car and drive. And get the fuck away from who I was and everything involved with it. And just drive from city to city, smoke different pot, eat different food, <laughs> and try to make people laugh. At the five-year mark, there was never a thought of anything else, guys. I still remember going to Michigan and meeting a girl, and we ended up going to Seattle. Do you think that was in my plan? And then I go to Seattle, and the first kid I meet is Josh Wolf. You think that was in my plan, you know? And I met Josh Wolf in a pool of 48 comics, 50 comics. Out of those 50 comics, three of them came down. 
And could you see that in Josh? Like, uh, like, could you, is that what attracted you to him, or was it just him personally? And it happened to be you too. I just knew he was a hustler and a winner. You know, I knew Josh, and he was really good looking. And I knew that what he was going for. I watched him on stage. We we both ate the same nachos on a Tuesday night when we were broke. You know, when you see that, it tastes a lot better. So what I want to tell comics is what I tell. The thing that pissed me off the most about my high school was my guidance counselor. Because he didn't tell me about New York City and all the opportunities I had there. Nobody ever told me about an acting class in New York City. My freshman year, I won the fucking improv thing. You know, I took intro to performing arts, and one of them was improv. And I went up there, and I sang like Shattered, and I won first place. Nobody pulled me aside and said, have you considered going into the city? Wow. Yeah, that wasn't really not, uh, considered back then. And nobody considered, nobody showed me the opportunities. So my mind was always closed to, dog, you could, you know, for years I thought, oh, I'll be in the city bartending and Bruce Willis will come in and hire me for a movie. That's like a stupid kid dream. That's like a pipe dream. Right. Does it happen from time to time? I'm a producer. I come into a movie theater, into a bar. We get hammered. You get me a gram of coke. I, I need a waiter for this movie. You, I'll give you the part for scale for two days. Well, like now that would be luck. But back then, it sounds like you didn't even like know that there were other ways to do it. No. And it wasn't until I was ready. Listen, I never thought I would go to L.A. Knock on wood and God bless Doug Stanhope for talking me into LA. I remember going, this is it. Doug Stanhope was walking me into the lion's den. I'm going to die. I'm going to get eaten alive up in LA. I ain't a fucking comic for LA. But Doug, I hit the floor running because I knew I wasn't the comic for LA. So now I had to work myself up to being that comic. You know, a year ago, I got a blue belt. Was I a blue belt at the time? Fuck no. But he gave me a blue belt after I was there for a year and a half. And over this year, beside the injuries, I've grown into being a okay blue belt. I could sweep, I could mount, I could do different things. Am I a blue belt with eight stripes? Am I a purple belt? Fuck no. My point is, when I got into the store, I wasn't ready. But just walking in that door and doing those sets got me ready. You know, there's a thousand stories about like baseball where a kid gets called up for the World Series and he ends up hitting three home runs. People are like, he's not ready. But after a game, he'll be fucking ready. You know, I never thought you were ready for this shit. And you were. You sat there listening and you sat there. And like I've told you a thousand times before, the common denominator was always the guys who kept pushing and hard work. They didn't give a fuck what you had to say. And they had, listen, having good people around you helps. Absolutely. If, you know, when those kids bother you and go, hey, man, how about me, you, Lee, and fucking, uh, we go to Boston, we get all the big comics and we make a movie. That movie will do a million dollars. What are you talking about, stupid? <laughs> I'm definitely... Uh... Oh. Meanwhile, you're mind fucking yourself with a stupid movie. Right. You could be writing a joke. This is just about writing jokes and getting on stage. That's it. I don't want to hear your nonsense. When I when it's time to hear your nonsense, I'll fucking call you. Until then, the only thing I want to hear from you is monthly, 32 sets, 48 sets, 52 sets, and I bombed 55 of those sets. You know, I don't care. Because I know the more you get on stage, you're gonna twist the the fucking odds. We've had these conversations lately. Oh, yeah. And it's with, oh, yeah. it's with anything. You know, right now I'm outlining a book. Did you know I, I didn't know? When I met you, I didn't know how to outline a book. No. You were bare, you were doing the blog. I couldn't even. Yeah, and that was a fucking nightmare of a blog. The spelling <laughs> was wrong. Oh, but now I could write a blog. I'm just lazy. I won't. I thought about it. I just don't know what I'd write a blog a fucking about, you know? So am I going to force the hand like a fucking move the law? Hell no. But it, it was, it, I love these talks, man. They mean a lot to me because it's, 
No, I love yeah. the food because I want to get this shit out there for people. Because the one thing that bothered me the most the last five years of living in L.A. was the hit and runners. And what you and I were not going to drop names. We had 100 hit and runners. We had people who thought we were going to save them. Oh, and okay. It got me mad because I was I couldn't save you. If you saved yourself a little bit, then I could help you. You just wanted to fucking bust and walk in. And, dog, I saw that my last 10 years more than any time I was there before. How many people were really just trying to piggyback and, you know, dog, how many people laughed at me when I started doing podcasting with Felicia Michaels? I still remember being at a fucking barbecue. I'm not going to tell you who was like, dog, you're wasting your time. Meanwhile, this poor guy right now is in no folks home somewhere. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome that you get to do that. It's it's really weird what the, people really don't know what they have inside them. And I hope from this podcast, especially tonight, they learn that there's more in them than they fucking really know. Because if you thought when I was in that jail cell, I saw myself on the set with David Chase, whether it was a good movie or a bad movie. You're out of your fucking mind. You know, when I walked on certain movies, when I walked on uh, the De Niro movie, I knew exactly what I was doing as an actor. Forget the stand-up. I knew exactly what I was doing. 2013, I had been acting for fucking 15 years at that time. I knew exactly where to sit, where to stand. That means I saved time. You know, I say I would go prepared, but I learned all that from stand up. Fuck. It's, it's, it's amazing how much I have like left to learn. It's, it's intimidating. But the learning, nobody could teach you. That's a problem with stand up. Nobody can teach you. What you learn is by going out there, by putting yourself out there. Right now, your next move is to contact, and I tell you this. As many one-nighters as you can in the five-state area. Somebody's got to have a name of a fucking booker who's got three rooms in Vermont. A Wednesday, Thursday, and a Friday. <clears throat> that, you know, he gives you a ski pass, he buys you two mugs of beer, and he puts you up. But if you really want to do comedy, you're thinking about 10 years from now. And even okay. then... You think in 95, I was thinking about 10 years from now? Just put me in jail now for felony lying. I never thought about that. Because in 95, I was 10 years away from the longest yard coming out. Do you really think I saw that coming? <laughs> oh, fuck out of my face. But I, have, I mean, you didn't have the resources that I have. So hopefully I can use it. I, I'm trying. I just knew I had to get stand-up. And I would get funnier. I couldn't afford acting class in 1995. But I knew that Robin Williams had impeccable timing from stand-up. And I knew there was a lot of other comics that had become great actors and rappers. So we always had a chance. But that's in the back burner. Let's get to be the, the thing that matters the most. The funniest motherfucker that we could be. I'm watching Star Vos's special tonight. Oh, it was good. Yeah, I heard it's really good. So I'm going to give him a shot. And that's it, Lee. We're two weeks away from Christmas. Next Monday we'll be on, and then we'll figure one podcast in before New Year's, because New Year's Day is a Monday. But yeah. maybe we'll do New Year's Day. I don't know. Let's see what the fuck's cracking in the world of podcasting. We'll figure it out. I can't wait. Figure it out. Well, I'm happy about tonight. I'm happy about your Sunday. It seemed like you had a great Sunday last week. It was great. And uh, it's time to go watch fucking Starbucks the special, eat a fucking cheeseburger with no bread, and fucking smoke a few numbers and see what happens with these edibles tonight, this mushroom. I love you, but I'll be at I'll be at Mohegan Sun this sun, this Thursday through Saturday with Josh Wolf if you're in the Holy town. shit. Congratulations, my brother. That'll be you, a buddy. great time. Call me when you're on the money. Well, I'll talk to you after this in an hour, probably. So. <laughs> yeah, but I'll, yeah, I'll definitely call you on Friday night. All right, let's do this. Have a great fucking uh, week. And now for a word from my motherfucking sponsors, Jack.
the freeze pipe. You need a little something to get you through the holiday family reunions? We all do. Freeze pipe wants you to smoke and save big with their holiday sales that are running now until Christmas. This is where you get grandma present, the neighborhood cop, the delivery guy, get them all little bongs. Perfect for anybody who's tired of harsh smoke and coughing all the time. Freeze pipe makes freezable pipes, bubblers, bongs, more than cool down smoke by over 300 degrees. Me, I love freeze pipe, guys. Right now I'm smoking like one of the, the many bongs that they sent me, and I love it. All you got to do is put the glycerin chamber in the freezer for an hour, and when you're ready to get down, pull it out, put it in, take a hit of that bong, and boom, nothing but icy clouds. The hell with Snoop Dogg. You can even keep the glycerin chamber in the freezer the whole time. You'll never have to wait. So do yourself a favor. Right now you're scratching your head. What do I get this guy? What do I? Freeze pipe. That's what you're going to get him. So go to thefreezepipe.com. Pressing code Diaz, D-I-A-Z, for 10% off your entire order. Who's better than freeze pipe? Nobody. That's right. Shop holiday sales running until Christmas or use code Diaz for 10% off at thefreezepipe.com. Order today and smoke like royalty. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what the hell that means. The, the line is smoke like a doctor, you fuck. Anyway, the joint is also brought to you by Manscaped. Listen, men, ladies, you got to shave that fucking mungwa. You want Santa to come? He can't come over and you got a bush that looks like a fucking jungle. This isn't about looking hot for a partner. This is about giving yourself the Christmas gift of silky small balls with Manscaped, the new performance 5.0 package. This motherfucker's a savage. The lawnmower 5.0's got the ultra, the ultra body trimmer. Forget about your ball sack. You can shave your eyebrows, your nose hairs, the hairs in your asshole with a fishing wire. It's tremendous. It also has the weed whacker, the nose hair trimmer, and the crop soother aftershave lotion, and the best one of them all, the crop preserver ball deodorant. It takes the wrinkles out of your nutsack. It looks like a baby's elbow. Anyway, you're going to love fucking Manscaped. When you get the performance package 5.0, Manscaped will even throw in two gifts, a super comfortable pair of boxes and a bag to store your goodies in with a zipper inside. I ain't saying nothing. Whether you're buying it for yourself or for someone you love for Christmas, I got a discount code for you. You ready? Get 20% off free shipping with code Joey at manscaped.com. Who does that for you? Nobody, cocksucker. That's 20% off with free shipping. At manscaped.com, use code Joey. Manscaped wants you to have a happy holidays. And here we go. For you motherfuckers who want to be international, the year is almost over. I know you want to make, uh, you know, resolutions. You want to learn a new language in three weeks. You got to use my people. Babel. That, they know all the languages. Those are other language learning apps, forget about it. They're just basically games that teach you nothing. Babel. We'll get you talking to the Mexican waiter. You're talking to the guy that throws knives at Benihana. Forget about it. <laughs> Babel will get you learning with 10-minute lessons. You'll be taught everything you need to have to work to be a world. You know, you can converse with anybody. Let's say you're going to a strip club. You want to learn Russian. Bam! There you go. Listen, I love Babel. It reminds me of my old school Spanish. It's easy. It's fun. And you'll look smart. And what else could you want? Studies even show that using Babbel for 15 hours is just like taking an entire semester of a college language course. So, aren't you sick and tired of, of the Mexican way they're not talking to you no more? You want to call them over. Senor, that's it. Where are you going to learn that? Babbel. And here's a special limited time deal from the check-in listeners to get you started for the holidays. I'm going to give you 55% off, but only for check-in listeners for Babbel.com slash Joey. That's J-O-E-Y. That's 55% off at babble.com slash Joey. Spell babble. B-A-B-B-E-L. They're even going to teach you how to spell babble in German or Romanian or something like that. So babble.com slash Joey. Rules and restrictions may apply. Merry Christmas. <laughs> 